Welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, live program. And uh, you can see from, uh, you, well, you, you may or may not see my background is uh, some beautiful, sunny, tropical background. That's not a real background. I just want you to be sure to know because I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's 21 degrees. We've had snow and more snow and very cold temperatures. Our lake, we're on the shores of Lake Erie, and Lake Erie is frozen. I'm sure we can learn more about how that might even affect the animals and the birds from uh, our program presenters today. But let's get started. Um, I want to um, tell you that the co-presenters that we're so fortunate to be learning from today, I want to, uh, we, is Christine Barnett, who is Wildlife Program Specialist, and Tim Jasinski, a Wildlife Rehabilitation Specialist, both on staff and the leaders there of Wildlife Rehabilitation at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. They have been just wonderful presenting beautiful programs every Monday at noon uh, for the month of February. And uh, so uh, if you do look on your screen, you'll see that these programs have been going February 1st, 8, 15, and 22nd. So next Monday is our last program, but I'm so happy you're here today. Um, the one thing I'd like to do here are the, is a list of programs. In today's program, you'll see on the slide, which is highlighted in yellow, the perils of bird life and how you can help. So the folks today are going to talk about from migration to habitat loss. It's tough out there when you're a bird. So we want to, they're going to be taking a look at all of the obstacles birds overcome and learn how we can help to ensure their survival. And here are our two presenters. These are real pros. We're so fortunate to have uh, Christine and Tim uh, in the Northeast Ohio region. They are definite leaders in the world of, of wildlife conservation and rehabilitation. I want to take just a moment before we get to our program today to take you just pictorially since we can't be there live. Uh, with our presenters, but do take a look at the photo on the left. And here we have a very beautiful springtime photo, what we're all looking forward to that'll be coming soon. Um, and this is what you will see when you park and arrive at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, which is based in Bay Village, Ohio, the far west side of the greater Cleveland metropolitan area in the US. And you see this lovely center nestled right in the community of Bay Village, Ohio. The middle picture shows you the gorgeous atrium that is the central focus of the building when you go into the building. And you can see plenty of classroom space uh, on the right. Uh, you can, there are live wild, uh, uh, wildlife exhibits there. There's classrooms. They have a nature shop where you can by all kinds of great goodies. Um, that's hosted by Well Birds Unlimited, I believe. And just a tremendous amount of, of learning educational materials that are really great. The two young people that you see here on the center and right slide, these are young wildlife uh, rehabilitation interns. And this is what a great way to get closer to nature uh, to learn more about the animals that are around us, that who we live with, whether we live in a rural area or in an urban area. So this is a really, really wonderful community resource. And let's go on. Oh, I put this photo in there because who would ever imagine that this a great community-based uh, center like this would also have a planetarium. And that's exactly what Lake Erie Nature and Science Center has. And they even have an astronomy club there that you can join. So I thought you would really be interested in that. What a bonus. So this is one of my favorite pictures and is a great, great photo of um, just a wonderful group of birders and wildlife enthusiasts hobbyists, experts, and pros who have gathered together and they're about to go on a bird walk starting at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in Bay Village, Ohio. 
And uh, what a great group shot. Um, and what they're going to do, I just want to take a second and show you another amenity uh, that's associated with the center. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm letting you know that this is just not about wildlife rehabilitation, but this center has so many wonderful little treasures. Um, this group is going to go birding. And if you look at the left side of this slide, you will see the red circle with the arrow where I have uh, circled the location of the center. The large green area is all park. And this is an important piece. Uh, what, a, what an incredible extension for the center. This is Huntington Reservation, another uh, beautiful treasure in um, the, the green necklace, the emerald necklace of the Cleveland Metro Parks. And this group that we just saw the photo of a minute ago, they're starting at the center and they're going to take a bird walk through that park, ending up, I don't know if you can see my cursor, ending up uh, at the lake, the, the shore, the northern, the southern shore of Lake Erie. So uh, all kinds of things here. And I'm telling you this um, too because I want you to consider making a generous donation to the center. As I've outlined, this is a, a treasure. This is a jewel for the region. And so at number one, I've identified for you that Lake Erie Nature and Science Center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. I've detailed the tax ID number there and a direct link for you to donate to the center. Anything that you donate at that link will be donated directly to um, the account of the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. Your number two, the second thing is another way to support the center and its good work is to go and uh, like the Facebook page. The Facebook page is Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. And go there and you'll have all kinds of uh, educational information. There's a bright blue donate button there. So just go there and make a donation and that likewise will go directly to the center. The third way that you can make a donation is to mail a check. And I've listed the address here. Just simply mail your check to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, Attention Wildlife Rehabilitation Staff, 28728 Wolf Road, Bay Village, Ohio, 44140. And finally, you can learn more about the details of these programs and how to make a donation to the center by reading the article, Make a Donation to Lake Erie Nature and Science Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, and you can follow the link on this slide. That will take you to the WC Audubon News Blog, where we have more information about the center and the program and how you can make a donation. So with that, we're going to take just a moment and we're going to switch our screens, if you can be patient just for a minute, and we're going to, um, can't wait. We're going to learn more about the perils of bird life and how you can help. Just a moment. While we're doing this, if anyone has any questions, does anyone have any questions? If you do, please write them in the chat or unmute yourself and politely ask your question. I don't hear anyone. So I'm going to turn the program over to Christine and Tim. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the big things that you heard over and over again is that we are uh, in addition to all of the nature classes, sanitarium classes, all of the fun programs and animals that we have on display, one of the huge things that we do that makes us really unique uh, is the wildlife rehabilitation program. Um, we are currently taking animals by appointment, so it's important that if you find a herd or injured animal that you give us a call and set up that appointment. That way we can, uh, we can provide you with this service 
uh, without any contact. So we can get your information and uh, just briefly uh, exchange the animal through the doorway and really make it a nice contact-free experience, which is really, really good. Um, we're going to talk just really briefly about what wildlife rehabilitation is. So if Justin, you want to go ahead and click over to the next slide for us. And don't worry, this slide will be uh, up again at the very end of the program. So if you missed any information on it, um, you'll get another chance to take a look at it. All right, so I love these photos that Tim pulled together. Uh, when we're doing wildlife rehabilitation, it's animals uh, that are hurt, injured, uh, babies that are orphaned. Most of the animals that we take care of are animals that have had some kind of human interaction. The problem that they're having has something to do with the way that humans have changed the environment, uh, the trash, uh, which we talked about in our last program that uh, humans have put into the environment. Uh, just the way that we've changed the landscape overall. So whether it's a baby duck that got separated from its mom because it couldn't climb over the curb, or whether it's an animal that was injured because it was uh, clipped by the you know bumper of a car as it was driving down the road. These are all animals that we want to help um, not only because they're injured, but because a lot of times the reason they even need help is uh, that their injury or the problem that they're experiencing was actually caused by humans and uh, our interaction with those animals in the first place. Uh, so that's another reason why we feel that being able to help these animals is so important and uh, help to correct some of the things uh, that humans can do to cause so many issues for wildlife. Uh, we are going to be talking, and uh, Justin, you can go ahead and hit to the next slide if you like. We are going to be talking a lot about the perils of bird life. Now, those of you uh, birders in the area are probably really aware that Tim is a bird guru. He's here working on our birds down in rehab. Uh, he's out bird watching. I think anytime that he's off, I'm like, oh, Tim, I need your help. He's like, yeah, I'm over here looking at these birds. I'm up at the lake checking out these birds. So Tim is going to be talking a lot today because it's all about bird life. And I, uh, of all the people that I know, Tim leads the most birds type of life, uh, sees a lot of those birds uh, both here at work and uh, in his personal life. So I'm really excited. Uh, I'll pop in here and there, but today is definitely Tim's day and he's going to be sharing so much of his knowledge with you. So with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, switch it and uh, turn it all over to you, Tim. Thank you, Christine. You're awesome too, by the way. So don't, don't uh, you know, discredit that. Um, we'll go to the next slide, Justin. So yeah, Christine talked about the perils of bird life, um, and we're going to particularly um, talk about things that we deal with as, at the rehab center here. Um, obviously, there's climate change um, and habitat destruction. Uh, that's two of the obvious things that are causing birds uh, to decline in their, their home ranges um, and their migration ranges. But today, we're going to focus mainly on things that we deal with specifically here at the center. Um, and uh, this is one topic that's a very touchy subject is outdoor cats. Um, I love cats. I have two of my own and they're my kids. Um, I'm more excited. I have more photos of those on my phone than birds, actually, so that's pretty ironic. Um, but I love my cats, and, but they just, they, they have no, um, they have no uh, like purpose in our environment. They're not native here. Um, and so I think the trouble with, with the cats being outdoors is most people don't see the side that rehabbers see. Um, the, the, the death and the injuries and, and things like that, that that we're seeing on a daily basis, multiple times a day, um, specifically through like April through probably September, um, we'll get five to ten calls about cat attack victims a day probably on average. Um, like that western palm warbler there on the right, uh, it was attacked by a cat and, uh, and, and most of these are known because the, the, the presenter will bring the animal in and the bird in and say, it was attacked by my cat, so we have to do a very delicate education on on that because most people don't think about it. They don't think that the cat is is causing bird population declines. Uh, they just one of the main common things we hear from cat owners is they go over they're taking care of the mouse population, um, but that's actually not the cat's job. Um, cats aren't native here, so um, they didn't evolve here. Cats were domesticated from the African wild cat thousands of years ago in Egypt, I believe. So 
um, you know, the North American birds uh, and anywhere around the world really didn't deal with a apex predator like this. The problem is they're cute and fuzzy and we, we love them. So there's a very kind of touchy way on how we have to handle the situation because um, we want to, you know, talk about keeping cats indoors to keep our birds safe and keep the cat safe. Um, my first cat lived to be almost 23 years old and she never went outside so she never got parasites and she never was able to attack and kill our wildlife. So um, annually uh, cats kill around uh, 3.4 billion songbirds in, in the United States alone annually. That's, that's insane. Um, that is a 100% preventable thing if we just had, you know, kept our kitties indoors or contained. Um, so it's, it's a huge problem. Um, that that the birds are facing, and uh, you know, it's just it's a it's a touchy situation, but we always want to educate on it um, because you know most people think that you know it's it's okay the cat just goes outside and he comes back, but while he's out there he's harming our native wildlife and and it's it's pretty unfortunate and and the cats have very bad bacteria in their mouth, so anytime they do attack a songbird or a small mammal or reptile or amphibian or anything, uh, the infection sets in and oftentimes most of the time we can't save them because of that. So. That's one of the number, number one reasons is, is kitties. And cats really um, will continue to feed. Um, even a well-fed house cat will still go out and hunt. Uh, cats are opportunistic, so uh, you can have a cat that is currently eating a kill, and if he gets that opportunity, he's going to stop eating what he already killed and grab the next thing that comes by. Um, they estimate uh, here in the United States that people own about 86 million house cats. Uh, the nice thing is a lot of those cats are indoor only, but a third of those cats are cats that people just let go outside. And so even though they're feeding their cat really well, I've never seen my cat bring me back an animal. Um, there's been studies done, uh, one done by Smithsonian, where they're seeing how many uh, birds are actually, and other animals are actually grabbed uh, not only the birds, but anywhere from uh, six to over 20 billion additional animals uh, besides just the birds are grabbed by cats as well. Uh, there was a study done uh, by the Journal of Ornithology in 2011 where they followed young gray cat birds. Just kind of funny, those cat birds that they studied, <laughs> uh, they don't get the name from the fact that cats eat them. Uh, it's more from the, the sounds that they make. Um, but in that study, it was in the suburbs in Maryland, and they tracked, they actually put little trackers on those birds, and they found where the birds were. And of those young gray cat birds, about 79% uh, of them uh, did not make it to adulthood. And the majority of those uh, were, uh, were injured by cats. They say that they're injured by cats because of the way that the carcass was found. Uh, the prey had been decapitated, but not consumed. And so that's where they're getting that this was an animal that was most likely injured by a cat. So these guys are out there hunting, even if they're well fed, um, even if you don't see that cat bringing it back. On top of our house cats, uh, they estimate anywhere from 30 to 80 million stray cats. So for every house cat that you have in your house, there could be another one out there um, also preying on these animals. Right. Again, that's good points, Christine. And, and another thing with the cat attack thing is uh, I point out to the callers um, is they say, well, my cat only kills chipmunks and mice. And it's, you know, you know th that is probably very inaccurate. Um, and chipmunks and mice are native. I mean, they, they belong here and, and the native you know, predator control for rodents are barred owls and, and mink and snakes and hawks and, you know, all of our native species. Um, and so that's one thing they don't think about. And when they say they only kill, you know, mice or chipmunks, um, that's not actually true because if you ever, if, if any of you have a cat, and I know many of you do, if you throw a toy, what does the cat do? It runs after it and grabs that toy every single time. And so that's what happens when they're outside. If a bird flies by, that cat's going after it. It's just instinct. So there's no way around that. So. Um, you know, cats are, I love cats and I could talk about this forever, but um, it's definitely one of the main issues that birds have, uh, it, you know, in, in North America and around the world really for, for their deaths. The next one um, is another huge one, um, is migration and window strikes. Um, it's a migration through, window strikes through migration really. Um, and some of these pictures obviously are going to be sad, um, but it's just the reality and we try to educate as much as we can on this. 
Um, all these birds were killed, um, were found downtown Cleveland by Lights Out Cleveland volunteers on one day. Um, these are all the deceased birds. Uh, it was uh, on October 26, 2017, and there were 255 collisions that the, that the team picked up. Um, birds were colliding all night long. Uh, we start at 5 o'clock in the morning and go till about 8, 8.30. Um, that day the team was collecting birds until after 1 o'clock because it was so busy down there. Uh, typically what happens is, you know, my, most migration happens at night for songbirds. Um, they follow uh, celestial cues and other things we don't understand while they're migrating. Um, at night it's cooler, there's no predators. Uh, or less predators, and so it's easier for the birds to migrate. And so before, one thing I forgot to mention too, before um, humans got onto this continent, the birds and other animals were doing their thing for, for millions of years. Um, and they, evolution takes a long time, but with humans, it's much quicker. We, we you know, we're a very intelligent species, and so we learn and, and change things quickly. I remember, you know, in the, in, you know, the early 80s, we had, you know, phones that hung up on the wall, and now everyone has a, a phone in their pocket and it can do all kinds of things like control your TV and other crazy stuff. So, you know, birds and other animals are developing slower. So all these injuries and all these things we see, these animals didn't evolve with. So they're not, they don't understand these kind of things. You know, it's just, it's not part of their DNA. It's not part of their, their, you know, their, their life. And so these birds are migrating and then they get into the cities um, that are very lit up because we want to have our beautiful cities. Um, um, and it affects birds in many ways, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But pretty much, when birds are migrating, that you know they're following north and south. Um, they they enter into our cities and they get into trouble. And so this day was was a particularly bad day because we had a low cloud ceiling, and uh, so that when the birds are migrating, they got to the city um, and they fly lower because of the clouds, and then they're right right there in with all the buildings. So um, this is a crazy day. And we've had other days that are over 200. Uh, I think we had a 215 day in 2019, and most of that's in the fall. Uh, typically, there's more 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 uh, window strikes in the fall because you have all the young birds coming down for their first for their first migration. Uh, but also, the migration routes are different. So in the fall, we see a ton of black pole warblers, but in the spring, we see very little, and it's just because of the way that the migration of that species goes. So go to the next slide. Um, so, on average, you know, you saw with the cats, the numbers, you know, with window strikes in North America, or in the United States, um, it's anywhere from 365 to a million birds that are they're killed, um, or almost a billion birds that are killed annually. Um, and that's just not sustainable, um, along with the cats. I mean, these birds are already dealing with, you know, like I said, climate change and other things that we, you know, that it's just, it's bringing their numbers down, and it's really quickly. And so we're going to lose these birds if we don't do something as, as conservationists and, and humans with our, our intelligence, we need to do something because it's going to be bad. Um, if you don't like insects, you're not going to like them a lot when we don't have these birds around because that's what birds keep those insects populations, uh, you know, good or down. So there's two reasons why we get window strikes, um, or there's two reasons why birds hit windows typically. Um, you can see in the middle there that black Bernian warbler. That's a beautiful photo that I took. Um, downtown, and you can see the shiny windows behind. They don't understand the concept of glass. And um, if you've ever seen a child run into a window, I know I did when I was a kid because we don't understand the concept of glass. And if you look at, you know, these fancy big doors that people have in these nice fancy hotels, there's little designs on the glass because if they didn't have that, people would run into the glass constantly. Um, and when you're doing construction, when construction is happening, I'll notice people uh, with glass doors being put up, they'll have like paper tape across it because, again, people are going to run into the glass. So it's the same thing with birds, and there's two reasons why birds hit windows for the most part. And on the left side, you see that the windows are, every, everything's dark around the building, but then it's very light inside. So for some reason, the birds are attracted to that white light. We don't really know why, but they collide with that, the, the, the windows because they're trying to get into the building, not because they want to be in there, but they're just attracted to the white light, just like moths at a porch light. On the right-hand side, you can see there, that is a perfect reflection. I mean, you can't even tell that's a building, especially if you're a bird. I mean, even people, you know, would look at that quickly and try to figure out what's going on. Birds, they have no, they have no clue, and they're just, that's, that's just, it's, it's obvious in that situation. So those are the two main factors. And when Lights Out Cleveland started, um, we, had a, we had thought that most of the birds would be, would be found um, before, before dawn, but actually we're finding that um, they, most of the strikes happen right at dawn because the birds are descending from the sky 
and then once it gets light out, they're going to try to feed, and so that's where these, these situations happen. So, um, so here you can see downtown has beautiful habitat for birds. I mean, I've seen more Connecticut warblers in my life downtown than on any birding trip um, with Jen Brumfield. So you know she's finding birds, and uh, they're, uh, they're, just, they're all over the place. And so there, there's so much habitat down there. I mean, look at all those bushes. This is perfect for sparrows. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Justin. That's just a reflection. So you can see that window behind you. There's a dead white-throated sparrow there on the ground. That bird just was fooled, just like everyone was in that slide um, before, because it was, you know, it was a, it's glass. Go ahead. Right here, there's, you know, there's still not much habitat, but there's still a tree there that, you know, that can house, you know, magnolia warblers and, and other ground creepers and other things like that. Um, go ahead. Uh, that's also another reflection. So um, that's just mirrored glass, and, and you know, it's just it's incredible what we do as humans. We know it's glass, but the birds don't understand. There's another kind of small little corner. Uh, there, there's some there's some habitat. It's amazing how many birds actually are downtown. We've I've seen eastern whippoorwills down there, uh, yellow rails, um, you know, ton of ton of cool species that normally you wouldn't be seeing, um, or you go to you know McGee Marsh in the spring to see. They're all over downtown and Wendy Park as well. So uh, Cleveland has such a great, great place for birds. Go ahead. Um, that was a reflection also. So you can see me standing there in the background of my shorts in winter um, collecting these birds. Uh, it, they, they don't understand that glass. Go ahead. There's another um, part. This is the fall of, of that other photo that I showed you down the downtown. This is a great place to see um, all the sparrows. I mean, I've, I've had seen Nelson sparrows down there, uh, Lacan sparrows down there, all kinds of cool things. Um, and that's also glass uh, and a reflection. So you can really see how you're getting fooled by this. Um, so that's with window strikes. <clears throat> um, that's, we can, I can talk about that forever. So I know we have to make it quick because I can talk about birds for hour days. Another thing we're dealing with right now, actually, is ice-covered roads. Um, the lake is frozen solid almost right now, I think. So um, water birds, again, didn't evolve with sidewalks um, or streets. And so on the left-hand side there, you can see that beautiful Porter Creek behind our center here. And on the right-hand side, it's our paved walkway um, right in front of the center, and it looks identical. Um, and I took both of those photos the same day to show the difference on, or not the difference, but like the similarities in, in that. So when a, when a, right now, when the, the, uh, the lake is frozen and all the other local lakes are frozen, <clears throat> these, the diving ducks and other species are kind of, most, most migrate out, but a lot of them stay because the, they kind of they bank with, maybe if I stay closer up north, I, I'm taking a chance on surviving or not surviving, but I'm closer to my breeding grounds to, grain, to, to claim territory. So a lot of the birds stay here in order to get back up north quicker than the birds that went farther south, but then the birds that went farther south, you know, they're probably safer because they have open water where up here they don't. So that's what we're dealing with right now. And the last couple of days we've dealt with a lot of waterfowl that are coming in, not really skinny, but they're extremely dehydrated because they, there's no open water. So um, when these birds are leaving the small little pockets of water that are still open, they're trying to fly around and fly around and fly around to find food or open water you know, where their food is. And uh, particularly diving ducks um, like grebes, loons, um, things like that, um, you know, scop and redheads, canvasbacks, um, those guys can't really walk on land well, particularly the grebes and loons. Um, you can go to the next slide. You can see their feet are set so far back on their bodies for diving that it, they evolved horribly on land. So they can get up to nest, but that's pretty much about it. So when a loon or, or, a, or a grebe or a ruddy duck um, are, are grounded, they're pretty much stuck on the ground. They cannot get into the air from, from that. So they're, they're, they're just they're sitting ducks, really. Um, maybe that's where that term came from. I don't know, but it's definitely an issue. So um, you know, if you see an injured uh, duck that's on the ground, especially right now, you can safely um, get into a, a container and call your local rehab center. Um, you know, we specialize in waterfowl here, but you know, if you find it in southern Ohio or something, call your local rehabber and they can they can adjust, you know tell you what to do. Loons and grebes can be very dangerous herons with the, those fish eating bills. So a lot of times we get a call about a duck down that's injured, and um, you know they'll say oh, the duck's black, and so you think it's a scoter, but it turns out to be a loon, and so you kind of want to handle that differently. So you can be very you just got to be really careful. So. That's what we're dealing with right now with these guys. So that's another thing that we deal with in, in, in a rehab with birds. Go ahead. 
What other one is pesticides? Um, you know, we don't really think about the secondary, in most of these situations, we're not really thinking about the secondary effects on, on you know, what, what's going to happen. One thing we didn't mention, Christine, with the cats is that when you're letting cats outdoors, you know, they're eating mice and things that are potentially uh, poisoned by, uh, by, you know, rodent poison, which we'll talk about later, but that's one thing that we t I tell cat owners, too, that, that that is a common thing. But pesticides is the number one thing. In spring, we see, um, like, you see these American robins here. These are two photos I took. One was in, uh, the baby one came in in 2010 as a fledgling, and he was fine. He was healthy, so we sent it back. Um, the people were worried that it was going to get eaten, but that's not our job as rehabbers to make sure things survive. I mean, things die in the wild, and that's natural. Um, so we sent it back. He was fine. Uh, went back with his parents. And then the other one, that's a pied robin um, with some loose, you know, some pigmentation issues. That was in Garfield on my friend's street. So uh, in spring, uh, the reason why we used robins for this slide is because they're the number one bird we think we see in the spring when all the snow melts and they're out walking around the grass. And everyone's like, oh, yay, robins are back. But robins have always been here. Um, they do migrate, but they're still here year round. They're just feeding on berries up in trees, so most people aren't looking at them unless you're crazy birds like we are. Um, so uh, in spring, people spray their yards for pests, you know, for pests. But um, you know, you're killing the insects, or the insects are slowly dying because of the pesticides. But then that's easier prey for birds, which then in turn the birds eat that, and then they get they get poisoned themselves. And we see a lot of that where people call and say, "I have a bunch of dead birds in my yard," and the first question we ask is, "Did you use pesticides?" And they oftentimes say, "Yes, we did." And that's the reason why. So we always try to educate on not using pesticides uh, or, or using things that are more um, safer for the environment, safer for our wildlife. So, and even if um, even if it, the bird itself is not ingesting the insects that have pesticides, those fledgling birds that aren't able to fly yet are spending a lot of time on the ground, hopping right through the pesticides that are sprayed onto the lawn as well. Um, really quick, Tim, did you? Uh, could you mention the bird safe window coverings um, yeah. and yeah. what some of those options are? Thank you. Yeah, and Betsy could probably put the link in there. But um, one, one thing for uh, most of the collisions, I forgot to mention, are at residential houses. So all those numbers, most of those are from homes. And you can do uh, things to cover your windows with, um, there's a couple different companies out there. There's, there's Feather Friendly, which we love using and recommending, Kaleidoscape as well. Um, uh, uh, ABC Bird Tape, Bird Savers, uh, there's a bunch of things on there. So um, that actually goes on the outside of the window prevent the to prevent the reflection that's causing the bird to be confused about that window. So yes, there, there is uh, our, our films you can get. They're just little fretted dots, um, and they go on the outside of the window, and that breaks up the reflection, and that will prevent window strikes at your own home. So thank you, Christine, because I thank have so many things in my mind. I forget about the main point sometimes. <laughs> um, Another thing that we do a lot here is automobile collisions or car, hit by cars, you know, trucks, uh, motorcycles even, um, bikes. Um, as you can see, these Canada geese and these mallards are um, flightless during the summer. I don't know if you thought about it, but uh, most waterfowl uh, are too heavy bodied to fly, to molt, normally like other birds do, where, you know, a cardinal will, will, will you know, lose one primary feather on each wing at a time, and it's symmetrical, um, and they can still fly that way, but, but bird, heavier birds like like waterfowl can't do that. They wouldn't be able to fly. So they evolved to drop all their flight feathers at once and they regrow them all at one time. And so coincidentally, that's what happens when, when they get to their breeding grounds and th they start to have a family. And the, the, usually with geese and ducks, it's about when the babies are about four weeks old. Um, that way they can still protect and attack predators like people. Um, when they're, you get too near a goose family, um, I know most people say they hate Canada geese. It's my favorite bird of all time. But they say they hate Canada geese because they're mean. And then I say, well, what happens if, I ask them if they have kids, and they say, yeah. And I say, well, what happens if you had a park and some guy run up on your kids, what would you do? And they say, well, I would fight them. And I'm like, well, that's what the geese are doing. But they're not being mean. They're just good parents. So that's, I always try to educate on that because it kind of gives us another thought process on, you know, what you're thinking about. So um, at that point, the geese are, are you know, the other birds are flightless. And, and then by the time the babies are full grown, the parents' wings are full grown, and then, then they can fly again. So um, geese can walk a long distance when they're flightless. It's amazing when we're trying to find babies that we've released and you would try to track some of our birds that we've released. They walk miles. It's unbelievable how far they can walk. So um, unfortunately in cities they cross roads and they get hit by cars and so that's one of the other main reasons why we get uh, you know injured animal, injured birds. Go next slide. 
Another one that we get um, very commonly is glue traps. Um, you know, these uh, luckily are just on the, the left side there are just our house sparrows. Um, they're a non-native invasive species, which we'll talk about later, but uh, we get chickadees, we get um, titmice, um, robins, uh, you know, eastern milk snake you can see there, toads, chipmunks, all kinds of things that are stuck on these glue traps. And these are very inhumane. I wish they would stop selling these because they're so inhumane. Um, and it, the, you can see they get stuck there, uh, their feathers are pulled out, and we get many calls about this, and we urge the public uh, not to use the glue traps, number one, and if you had you lose, use glue traps, you don't understand, you know, about the, the perils that can happen to our birds and other animals. Um, you can see that top left photo, there's a June bug stuck in there, too. And so the birds are going to that, that free food source that's, that's moving but not going anywhere, and that's how they get entrapped. Um, same thing with the snake. So um, one thing we urge the public to do, if they find a bird or an animal that's in a, in a glue trap, don't remove it. Just put the trap and the bird, you know, whatever it is, in a box and then call us and bring it to us so we can safely remove it because it's a very delicate way you do that. And oftentimes the public helps and it, the bird ends up not surviving. And most of the time, the, young, the small, tiny birds don't survive just from the stress of getting them out of the trap, getting the glue off of their feathers, then getting their feathers clean again. It's just a very, very hard process. So um, we always urge don't use glue traps. That they're very inhumane. Sticky traps for flies, um, the, this is another thing that's, that, that is very common, particularly in horse barns. Um, you know, people don't want the flies in the horses, which totally makes sense. Um, we get a lot of chickadees, barn swallows specifically caught in these. Um, it's a free food source. Look at all those tasty insects on there. That's a, that's a free buffet right there for that chickadee, but unfortunately the chickadee is stuck and, and, and ultimately didn't survive because of the ordeal that he dealt with. Um, so there are other ways to set up fly traps in barns that are safe for, um, for birds and, and that it still can trap the flies. Um, there's things you can do with pop bottles and things like that um, where the flies, the flies go in but they can't get out and then they die in there. Um, but definitely we don't recommend these sticky traps because we get tons of birds stuck in them, particularly the aerial insect eaters. Snap traps are another thing and uh, this European starling got caught in this snap trap and I don't remember where it was found in someone's basement or something I think. <coughs> um, so these are the one, the one mouse trap that we, you know, we will recommend using if it's inside the house specifically, because obviously we don't, mice, we don't want mice in our house, and that's the quickest way to, to dispatch them where they don't suffer. Um, and, uh, but we do have people that call and have traps set outside in their yard because they don't want chipmunks, and there are other ways to discourage that. Um, we don't recommend using snap traps because we do get native species that are caught in those often. So, um, you know, always call us if you have a question about those kind of things. Go ahead, next slide. Entrapment building is another thing that, that birds uh, get, get uh, into trouble with. This snowy owl came in in 2016, uh, uh, 2013 rather, um, uh, when we had that first eruption of the snowy owls. Um, it was, I think it was December, January of 14 actually. Um, he got in the, the, the Lorraine Playhouse Theater, I think it is, in, in Lorraine, the basement somehow. I, we have no idea how we got in there. And when they called and told us that there was a snowy owl in the basement, we're like, okay, yeah, that's a good one, <laughs> you know. And then they're like, no. And he started talking about eruptions. We're like, okay, maybe he knows what he's doing. He sent this photo, and you can see this this young snowy owl is just covered in soot, and dirt, and gross stuff. And um, so he was uh, rescued and brought to us very, very skinny. We don't know how long he was down there. Um, you can go to the next slide. That cute little fuzzy feet there and that face. He started doing better, and then eventually we were able to release that bird back in Lorraine where he came from. Uh, at the lake away from <laughs> originally where he was trapped in. So entrapment buildings is, is a very common thing. It's mostly common, it seems to be with house sparrows, starlings, and wrens. I don't know why um, the, the starlings and the house sparrows, I think they're just because they're around people so much. Uh, wrens are sneaky little, little dudes and they can sneak under the door um, and get into buildings that way. So um, always call us you know, with how to remove a bird from <laughs> building safely. Um, this is another one. We could, Christine, you want to touch on this? Because I know you dealt with this bird on the right here specifically this, this last winter. Oh, yeah, unfortunately. Um, the non-target rodenticide is a really, really huge problem, um, not only here, but throughout the world. Uh, what we're, you know, people are trying to do is trying to kill rodents, uh, specifically mice and rats 
that they don't want in their yard. So they don't want eating their bird seed. Uh, they don't want uh, overwintering in their garages uh, because rodents can cause a lot of damage um, in your home and in your garage. Uh, so a lot of people just don't want those rodents there. Um, unfortunately, when you're putting poison out, you don't know what is going to get into that poison. So it could be a mouse or a rat that gets into that poison, but it could be a chipmunk, it could be a possum, it could be a lot of other animals that pick up and eat that poison directly, uh, which is one problem. But the other problem is um, that these poisons then can be carried within the animal's body. So the animal that eats that poison uh, can then uh, transmit that poison to any predators that then eat that animal. Um, so this is a huge problem that goes on throughout the world. Uh, between uh, 1998 and 2015, there's been a ton of different reports about how non-target uh, rodenticide affects those higher level predators. And unfortunately, there is no big report of uh, everyone around the world, how they got together. Even here in the United States, there are several different reports um, but luckily, uh, someone who was uh, publishing a paper in the uh, Journal of Veterinary Science uh, did collect a lot of these reports and put some of that information together. Uh, when they pulled the information together, a lot of it was looking at the types of um, buildup of rodenticides that are in the animals. Uh, early rodenticides, it would actually take multiple times of the animal eating it in order for the animal to die. Uh, obviously, people did not like that. They wanted something that that animal ate it, it would die uh, really, really quickly. So the most popular rodenticides right now are anticoagulant. So that's going to cause the blood not to, uh, not to coagulate. It's going to allow blood to seep into areas of the body where blood uh, doesn't belong. And these things um, can affect animals very quickly, especially in the cases where we've got raptors that are grabbing rats and mice, chipmunks, and eating uh, an animal that maybe just recently ate that rodenticide and hadn't, um, hadn't passed away yet. Because these guys, they're, they're hunting active animals. So um, they're out there killing things that are alive and sometimes they'll grab stuff that comes out of your barn. And in fact, I had a screech owl in my garage hunting mice in my garage. Um, so it's very, very, uh, very, very easy for these birds of prey that live in populated areas to get a hold of a rodent um, or another animal that uh, has had these rodenticides. Um, when they did that study, uh, they studied a lot of dead uh, birds of prey and realized that 60% of them actually did have those rodenticides present in their bodies. Um, even, uh, even birds of prey whose main diet wasn't just mammals. Um, birds of prey whose main diet were other birds and reptiles and invertebrates, still 60% of all of those species um, had some rodenticide buildup in their livers already. Um, if we want to take a look at uh, the next slide, you can see that um, you've got your target animals, so those rodents, the mice and rats that they're targeting, but these rodenticides can get into a lot of other animal species. They've found them in um, small birds and in vertebrates. Uh, when we've got poisons that we put out, a lot of times uh, those will be broken down by liquid, water, rain, things like that, and get washed into our waterways. So now we're looking at our marine animals uh, getting a buildup of some of those uh, rodenticides, our shorebirds. And again, when we're looking at raptors, they're going after and eating only other animals. So if you have a smaller animal that's been eating a little bit of rodenticide, a little bit of rodenticide, um, and then you have this bigger animal that eats maybe six uh, six rats that have a little bit of rodenticide, suddenly he's getting all of the rodenticide from those six rats, and that's going to start to affect their body. So that biotoxicity, that buildup over time, 
And um, with that kind of buildup, it's really hard to see right away. Um, and a lot of the cases that we see are, um, are pretty severe and more likely caused by that um, he ate something that just ate the rodenticide. Uh, but even if it wasn't right away and those severe cases, the rodenticides can still build up over time uh, within the animal's bodies. Um, so it's really uncertain as to why, uh, besides the fact that they're getting such a high dose, but uh, raptors in particular of the higher apex predators, raptors seem to have a more, um, more sensitivity. Uh, they've been doing some studies, but not a whole lot out there. Um, there was a study done specifically on eastern screech owls, and in that, they realized that the, uh, the rogenocytes were actually staying in the liver of the screech owls twice as long as they were uh, kept in the livers of uh, some of the mammals that were also included in the study. So they think that that longer half-life, that longer period that it takes for the liver to rid toxins from the body may be part of the reason why raptors in particular over things like foxes and coyotes are having a, uh, are being affected, uh, but there's still, as always, more studies that need to be done. Uh, better than studying why it kills the animals, an even better thing to do would to not be using these non-target rodenticides, these things that can build up in other animals. If we weren't using those, uh, then we wouldn't have to worry about the buildup of them in those higher level um, those higher level predator bodies in the first place. Do you go back to the owl real quick, Justin? So um, this great horned owl um, came in um, last, since 2020, I'm kind of lost on what years we're in, but she came in, uh, I think it was in, in December, um, and she was in, showing the symptoms of uh, non-target rodenticide poisoning, seizures, very, very skinny, um, you know, and just having all kinds of issues. So we treat her for specific uh, drugs that, that help with, with the anticoagulant issues. And uh, she came in at 1,300 grams, and that's a very, very skinny grain hot. It's a big, she was a big female. And um, we were able to turn her around and release her at 2,600 grams. So she gained double her body weight before she was let go. And that's a great thing, but even better in that situation was the fact that we educated on the non-target rodenticide poisoning. She came from a hotel um, in Middleburg Heights. And we educated the people, um, actually Laura Takis, the animal control there from Middleburg, she educated the, the hotel on, um, you know, hey, this is what happened to this owl, because they're the ones that called us her about it. Um, and he was devastated. He had no idea that that, that had happened. So, so he, was, he quickly switched the bait um, that they were using to another bait that is, that is on the market that, you can, that, that, that the companies can use that are not, they're only going to cause issues for the first animal, not the second animal. So um, there's other options we can, that we can do to try to control um, overpopulation of rodents. Um, it, it, you know, so always call us or, or a rehabber or an educator on what to do in the situation before you start trapping and, and doing poisoning because uh, not all the animals, uh, like this red-tailed hawk here on the left, um, are able to be saved, unfortunately, and that bird ended up passing away um, due to the, the poisoning suspected. But it's, it's, a, it's unfortunate. But that great horn, was, was, she went back to her territory, and she's happy in the wild again. Go two more sides. The other thing we deal with, um, not as often, but it does happen, is oil spills. Um, when we got, uh, you know, those, those freezing temperatures a couple years ago, a lot of times, for some reason, a lot of the, the mills still had the, the, the water open because of the, the things they were doing, and it, it, there was, you know, there was contamination, and we got a lot of birds that year. So that this canvas back here and this ruddy duck. Um, that angry ruddy duck, by the way, they're always angry. I don't know why, but they're like a little the small dog syndrome where they're very, very angry and they'll attack you and bite you. Um, and they're just a tiny, cutest little thing ever. So <laughs> super funny. But this, the, this canvas back, um, we washed that bird, uh, clean it up, and, and we were able to release that bird. So um, this is one thing that we don't, like I said, don't deal with on a big basis. Um, I know on the coast, like uh, Tri-State Bird Rescue, International Bird Rescue, they specialize in oil spill, oil spill disasters. And we are prepared for an oil spill if it had happened in Cleveland. You know, we do specialize in waterfall here, and uh, we, we do have the, the tools needed to, to, and the training to, to, 
to treat these guys, but luckily it doesn't happen often. I don't remember last time we had a, a, a duck in that was oiled, but um, sometimes we'll get starlings or house sparrows that fall into grease traps at restaurants. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll talk about that later, but uh, that's, that's, you know, one thing that we deal with. Another thing that, that we, we get often, and we actually have seen more of it this winter for some reason, is uh, conjunctivitis from, uh, and it's often caused from dirty bird feeders, so it's very contagious. I actually learned uh, from another rehabber recently that um, we think that, that they're so contagious to this because um, it's spread from domestic chickens, so it's spread from that to the native finch population, and, and it seems to be mostly finches that, that get this. I, I mean, I'm sure that other species can get it, but for the most part, we see American goldfinches and house finches with it. And uh, it's, it's easily treatable um, if you get them early enough. And that bird on the left there, that American goldfinch, that's the first day it came in with its eyes all crusty like that. And just with a couple days of eye meds, they'll turn, it turns clean, just like the house finch there on the right. You can see that his eye is still really swollen, though, and he's got that kind of little like red underneath the eye there. Um, we'll treat him for 21 days on an antibiotic, uh, and then we'll make sure a, a week after that that they're okay and they're not, it's not coming back. And then we always get that bird back to the same population it came from. Uh, even though birds do fly, we get them back to right where they came from so they're, if it for some reason is still in their body and it, 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 you know, it's still there, it's not going to pass to another population. So um, this is often seen at bird feeders um, you know, that, that aren't cleaned often. So um, we, we tell the callers that if they can capture the bird safely, uh, and then clean their feeders, bleach all their feeders, make sure everything's clean, um, and then you can start feeding the birds again so that, you know, that happens. Um, do you want to talk about, um, Christine, do you want to talk about the part of other things that they can, they can yeah. spread? Um, definitely, uh, when you're cleaning out your bird feeder, you want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that is safe for the birds. You don't want to use a lot of chemicals, um, not a lot of greases. Uh, what I put up here was a screenshot of the All About Birds website that's uh, run by Cornell University. Uh, so they have all kinds of uh, all kinds of information, of course, about birds. As, as birders, you guys are probably well aware of Cornell um, and the All About Birds website by now. Um, but it's not just the conjunctivitis that we're worried about. Uh, it can be things like uh, seed becoming really moldy, uh, starting to decompose. Um, species that's left, uh, birds can spread salmonella and things like that to each other, um, in addition to uh, the conjunctivitis and the other diseases. So just making sure that you are cleaning your bird feeders out regularly, whether it's a seed feeder or whether it's a feeder for hummingbirds, um, keeping those nice and clean, never putting any oils or greases. I know a lot of people don't like it when the squirrels are eating their food or if it's the, uh, the hummingbird feeder and they've got a lot of uh, wasps coming to them, people will put grease and things uh, on those to keep other animals off, and that grease is going to ruin your bird's waterproofing, it's going to uh, harm their ability to fly, it's going to harm their ability to stay warm, so just making sure that you're cleaning these thoroughly, uh, cleaning them regularly, and making sure that you're not doing anything that would hurt all of the birds that you're trying to feed and care for. Another thing that we deal with that, you know, again, like I said, a lot of these things are um, situations that birds run into that they didn't evolve with. And so um, often it's killdeer chicks um, uh, that are trapped on rooftops, um, gulls too. Um, you know, when humans built rooftops, there's usually a ledge up there. Um, usually it's a gravel, gravel roof and, and a lot of species like common nighthawk, um, killdeer, um, gull, you know, herring gull, ring gull gulls. Um, Canada geese mallards will nest on rooftops because they don't understand the concept that they can't get off the roof. They didn't evolve with roofs like that. So they get stuck up there and um, sometimes, uh, the, you know, the parents are able to kind of coax the babies over the edge and they can jump to the ground, which they're okay with. Um, and they can, they're so light that they don't hurt themselves. So, you know, we get calls about ducklings or, or goslings on rooftops. The parents are there and the babies can jump down. You know, they'll jump down and they're okay. They, you know, wood ducks nest in trees, many other species nest in trees, so that's a natural thing, falling to the ground like that, but it's not, definitely not natural when it's hot up there and they can't get down. So, um, you know, there's, there's different ways you can mitigate that. You can make a little ramp for them to jump up and, you know, different things like that, but um, that's, that's one other thing. We deal with more so with gull chicks um, on rooftops because gulls typically would nest on rocky islands or outcrops or you know, the shoreline, but we don't have that anymore. You know, humans kind of really 
destroyed all that habitat. So they kind of uh, adapted their nesting habitats, their habits to nest on rooftops. And, you know, it gets hot in the summer, and it gets hot. If you've ever been on a roof in the summer, you know it gets really, really hot. So gulls are um, semi precocial babies, which means that they rely on the parents to bring them food and keep them warm and protect them, but they can, the gull chicks can eat on their own the day they're born, they can eat on their own. Uh, where killdeer chicks are the same thing, um, or actually not the same thing, they're, they're precocial, which means they can feed and walk around on their own, but they need the parents' protection and warmth. Then you have altricial babies like cardinals, bluebirds, tree swallows, hummingbirds, where they are fully dependent on the parents for everything. Um, and so it's kind of neat how these birds evolved. The gull chicks, you know, they, they have a little territory that the parents claim that the babies can walk around on. So you'll have, you know, thousands of nests in one colony, but they have a little territory made out by where the parents are. They, they claim that for, from fighting, um, but that kind of goes all out the window on a hot roof in the summer. And so then all the chicks bail off the roof, they fall to the ground, and a lot of times they're too big, uh, and they get injuries or they get lost because, you know, the parents, like I said, are, are you know, taking care of them. And, and a lot of times the parents, they know which babies are, are there somehow. I don't know how they can do that, but they hear that sound of that ba those babies, they know they're theirs, and they'll still tend them on the ground, which is a good thing. The bad thing is a lot of times it's in a parking lot. It's an industrial parkway where there's a lot of trucks and, you know, we get a lot of injuries from that. So that's, that's one other thing that, that we deal with in, in, a, in, a, in a rehab center. You want to talk about this one, Christine? Did she not hear us, maybe? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't turn my, my volume back on. Um, <laughs> uh, the non-native invasive birds is a huge one. And these guys, um, the ones that we're seeing here, the starlings, the house sparrows in particular, um, these birds were actually brought on purpose into the country because they're beautiful birds, they're in literature, they're in songs, they're in, um, they're in a lot of paintings and drawings. So, uh, you know, people brought them in. Uh, I believe uh, Tim said that they had been brought in because they were in Shakespeare and released in uh, Central Park in New York. So these were brought on purpose. Uh, the big problem here is, uh, like with the cats, there's just, uh, there's no uh, native predators for them. They can outcompete the birds that are here because they were uh, developed in a totally different habitat. And so the ways that they uh, get nesting sites, the uh, ways that they fight with other birds. So these guys are going to be pushing smaller birds out of the way, especially when it comes to starlings. Uh, they're going to take over territories, um, actually take over nest sites. Uh, the house sparrows do the same thing. And they'll go in and they'll not only push those birds out, but they'll actually kill the birds, um, whether it's the adults or the babies in the nest. So not only are they taking over nesting sites that our native birds need in order to reproduce, but they're actually actively killing the adults and the babies who have managed to hatch from those nests. Um, so these guys are doing a lot of damage, even though, you know, as bird lovers, we love birds, they're beautiful, their songs are great, um, just the colors that reflect off of the starling's feathers are amazing, um, but these guys are out there uh, really doing a whole lot of damage because the birds that live in this area didn't, um, didn't uh, develop with that. them. They don't have ways to, uh, to fight off or fend off these birds. And the left bird there, um, I asked Christine what species it was, and she's like, ah, <laughs> it's one of the trickiest <laughs> birds that, that birders run into in the spring, um, and that's a young brown-headed cowbird chick. Um, they are a native bird to North America, but not the eastern part of North America. They evolved out west, and um, they evolved to follow the bison herds around, where, you know, it was grassland, an open grassland for these birds, or for the bison, so the bison would travel, and the cowbirds evolved to follow the bison around, and in order to follow the bison, you know, how are you going to breed and, and pop, repopulate if your, if your food source, you know, is moving, the bison are kicking up all the insects, so they, they, they evolved that way, and so out west, they, they evolved to lay their eggs in other birds' nests, um, like, you know, yellow, yellow warblers um, and different others, all different species, 
But out west, the, the native birds started to figure out what was happening over you know, evolution over the years. And so they started you know, IDing the, 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 the eggs that are not theirs, and then they'll build a nest over that, and then re, relay a clutch. And so they kind of, they can, they can counteract with it a little bit, but out east they can't because out east we used to be all woodlands. And so when humans got here and messed up the landscape and cut all the trees down, then the cowbirds started moving east, and that's another issue that these, that's causing uh, declines in, in our native species, particularly the Kirtland's warbler up in Michigan where they nest. Small little spots in Michigan and Wisconsin and, and Ontario where the Kirtland's you know, nest um, was hugely caused by, uh, declines were caused by not only pesticides and habitat loss where they, where they winter, but also because of the cowbirds. So um, I think it was in the 80s they, uh, they had a cowbird uh, trapping population where they, or, um, uh, organization where they had a trap out there in the habitat with the Kirtlands where they would catch female brown-headed cowbirds um, and, and put them in a trap. It's like a little aviary kind of thing. And then the, the males would come around and sneak in, get into the, into the enclosure, but they couldn't get back out and they were humanely euthanized after that. And so that really helped the Kirtland's warbler habitat, not only um, you know, for restor restoring their, their na the native trees, the, the jack pine forest up there, because um, the, the jack pine forest, the, the way the trees repopulate is, is by fire. So um, obviously that really can't happen now because of the way that the landscape is. So uh, the division of, a division of wildlife there in Michigan um, you know, did restoration projects where they, they do controlled burns and then replant new trees. And so that's why the Kirtlands are now back up to a good population. Um, but their cowbirds are still a, a, a huge problem for our eastern birds because they, they didn't evolve with that. So that's, that's another thing. Want to close it up, Christine? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, we talked a lot about uh, some of the things that are affecting the birds in our area and a lot of the perils and things that birds have to deal with. Uh, hopefully, along the way, you also picked up some great ideas for helping those birds out, things like um, putting bird safe uh, coverings on the outside of your windows, uh, using snap traps indoors only instead of using the rhododendrons, um, keeping your cat in the house. I know. It was tough. Uh, all of my cats have been cats that I've taken from the wild, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, they've hated me for months, uh, but then after a while got to the point where they didn't even want to go outside where the rain and the snow was. Um, so it can be tough, but if you love your cat, you're going to help keep it safe uh, by keeping it indoors. So hopefully you got a lot of information about some of the things that you can do to help these bird populations uh, because life out there for a bird is pretty tough. Uh, again, if you find yourself uh, with an injured animal, whether it's a bird, mammal, um, or reptile, you can go ahead and give us a call. It's a good idea to call us before you come our direction. Like I said, uh, we are taking animals by appointment, uh, but sometimes those animals don't even need help. We're going to talk a lot about that next <laughs> week. Um, but give us a call first. Maybe we can help you through your situation. And if that animal does need to come in, we can make that appointment and make sure that that's a contact-free appointment uh, and help stop the spread of COVID. So uh, Tim and I are here. Uh, you'll get one of us seven days a week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Chris and, and Tim. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to switch our slides. And uh, please, let's give our, our presenters a nice, uh, a good happy clapping or a happy smile for a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, Christine Barnett, Wildlife Program Specialist, and Tim Jasinski, Wildlife Rehab Specialist at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center who you see on the slide, the screen here. Um, I, before we go and wrap up the program, I'd like to tell you about next week's program, our last one for the month of February. So baby season, does baby wildlife really need our help? You can see it at the bottom of the screen here, in, highlighted in yellow. Many people see a furry baby, baby animal and immediately want to help. Sometimes baby animals need a helping hand, but most of the time our good intentions can become more harmful than helpful. 
So in this program, next week, next Monday, same time, same place, we're going to learn when to intervene and when to leave the baby alone. Uh, the next, uh, do get a ticket. Um, you can get these tickets at the link on your screen at the bottom. Uh, go to the events section of the wcautobahn.org store. And that way we can make sure we know who's coming and register. If you're registered, we can give you a warm welcome. The next screen, just before we leave, I do want to go once again. I want to make um, an, an, a strong invitation to you to please give a generous donation. Uh, wildlife rehabilitation specialists are some of today's, I believe, unsung heroes and heroines. And working under tremendous pressure, they continue to aid and assist injured wildlife despite the crippling effects of climate change that are now compounded by social and economic complications uh, re uh, as a result of COVID-19, social distancing, and any number of other, other um, or reactions. So Lake Erie Nature Science Center is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, I have on the screen here the tax ID number. And please make a donation at the donate at the HTTPS top link uh, at, on the slide. The next way that you can support them uh, is go to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center Facebook page. Uh, follow it, like it, uh, share the post there with your own friends and family on Facebook. Uh, email uh, the announcements, email uh, posts they have there about, about events that are happening to your friends and family. Help get the word out. And it just doesn't take a lot of your time, just a little bit. Uh, be strategic, target those posts, and send them out um, to your friends and family. And do take a look at the very top of the Facebook page is a bright blue button that says Donate. And when you click on it, make a donation, and it too will go directly to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. The third way that you can support is by mailing a check. And I have here, again, the mailing address on the screen. And if you want to learn more about the details for these programs and the fundraising, ways that you can help to uh, help fundraise uh, on behalf of the center and support this, these wonderful services, you can go and uh, do go to WC Audubon News Blog, make a donation to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, and you'll see the link at the bottom of the page. So thank you, thank you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, to have you here with us. Thank you for joining us. I hope that we see you next week. And uh, bravo, everyone. Thank you, Chris and Tim. Thank <laughs> you.